came from all this facility and my own t-shirts were here. So I made that for myself. But oh, there's one machine on the planet called Luna, which is an accelerator underground. You know, for some cross-section at low energy, so they are so small you actually have to go underground to shield, to shield against cosmic rays and headhunts. And we are about to build the same facility or a similar facility, let's say, in Germany, in Dresden, where I'm located. We have an underground effort with Phoebus in, in Europe. It's not as deep as the Kronzato Mount, which you have seen on the first slide. But uh, <coughs> just enough shielding to get rid of uh, all the headphones, 110 meter water equipment. And we have shown with some clever kind of anti comp suppression we told which we borrow from Europe or saying that within a factor of three to five, you can reach the same kind of cross sections like you know. So, in case the <coughs> small ones are a blended <coughs> of However, this machine can go not too far away from it, and in addition, it has, instead of 400 kV, which is the maximum energy of Luna, this will be a 5 kV machine. So this is the underground place, and this is the accelerator, and so all this system, we are preparing for it, if nothing goes completely wrong, hopefully the end of beginning of next year, uh, we have this whole stuff installed underground, and it's supposed to be a user facility, so it's not for us for just for us to play. So if you have some proposals or some ideas what you want to measure and you need low energies and low weak or small cross sections, uh, maybe come in touch with us and maybe because there are so many people you doing nuclear astrophysics, there can be some kind of common collaborations. So this will be advertising for something completely different. Okay, now thank you double reading maybe that's me in my office thinking about the talk. <laughs> so I'll well, well, uh, give you the idea of what is double real decay, what's the physics behind it. So this is a long, it's a touch with us, particle physics, so I'm be aware of that. Uh, and some very general issues to make you aware of how, how difficult it is to measure 10 to 25 years half-life. It's not straightforward. Some experiments, and um, you will say, if, a, if, I have, if I have some time, mention something on alternative modes, which means some electron capture. So uh, this is all linked. The major importance for us is neutrino physics. So are neutrinos very special or only special? Well, we already know they are very special. They are special. In a way, they are the only fundamental drama which is not charged. And uh, so therefore, and it's not a part of the nucleus, and so it's only, only interaction field if you ignore gravity for a second. It's a weak interaction. Furthermore, as you have heard, weak interaction is maximum parity violating. So the only two states which are actually Participating in weak interaction are left handed neutrinos and right handed empty neutrinos. However, as I said, they are uncharged, and the question, in contrast to all the other parameters, is, is a neutrino its own anti particle or not? Because we don't know, because if these two guys exist, which would make them similar to all the other elemental, uh, elemental, par elemental particles, uh, they wouldn't interact in the weak interaction. That's why we nowadays call them sterile neutrinos. And then the neutrino would indeed be like all the other ones. But Edward Majorana already came up about 70, 80 years ago with the idea that the neutrino could be its own anti particle. So that's at the left handed and the right handed state. And if this is true, we violate total leptron number by two units. But this is a major step forward. I mean, when I was a student, I learned that later the leptron numbers are conserved and total leptron number is conserved. But we know oscillations have already slaughtered. Uh, the, the flavor lepton number violate, uh, uh, conservation, however, violating total lepton number has much more profound implications on a lot of things like uh, the baryon asymmetry in the universe by leptogenesis, and making the neutrino its own antiparticle is a big step beyond the standard model, and it also needed to explain why neutrinos are so much lighter than all the other fundamental objects. So that's the idea. So what is double beta decay? Well, as a word, it implies it's single beta decay twice. Right? We have a nucleus decaying into its daughter emitting two electrons and two antineutrinos. This is a standard model process. It's, you see here two neutrons by, by chance decide to decay at the same time. As you can imagine, it's just very unlikely. So, so this, this will happen is on the level and half-lives coming from this particle physics would call it a higher order process. So half-lives are the ballpark of 10 to the 20 years. But this mode has been observed. However, the more exciting mode, the neutrino this double beta decay, the nucleus decays into its daughter, and two electrons without any emission 
of neutrinos like the one we are in hunting for. Oh, hopefully the animation doesn't work. <clears throat> so what, what will happen here? So the neutrino, the first, you can imagine it's a single atomic nucleus and the neutron decay and everything, a right-handed anti-neutrino, which like in beta decay, which in a ma magic way must be absorbed at the second movement as a left-handed neutrino. So what you need is, the first thing you need, the neutrino must be an anti-neutrino, otherwise it can't work. So this is the first thing, and this is exactly what I mentioned on the previous slide. This is a Majorana particle, a neutrino with its own antiparticle. Furthermore, you have to match the helicity. If the neutrino would be mass, if you have a pure right-handed anti-neutrino, anti and a right-handed stability here, but you need a left-handed component as a second neutron. So if the neutrino is mass, this wouldn't occur even if it's a Majorana. However, if you give a the easiest way to match the helicities, is actually giving a neutrino a non-managing rest mass. Because then you have the left-handed com component at the fixed at the first neutron, and this component will be absorbed at the second neutron. So the larger the neutrino mass, the larger this left-handed component, and the more likely is double beta decay. So our way of measuring is more like a seesaw, but like a beta decay, where you look at an endpoint. We make our kind of mass measurements uh, the lighter the neutrino, the uh, less likely is double beta decay, and therefore the longer the half life. On the other hand, if you see a half life, you see the process, uh, you can determine the neutrino mass. So, these are the two essential things to measure the neutrino mass via half life measurement and double beta decay, and seeing it implies that neutrinos are their own antiparticles. And as I said, the measurements have half lives or expected half-lives that we are taken 25 years. Well, just here is an example. Uh, this is the isobar of A equals 76. You see all the guys on the left side are falling down by beta decay. So sink, sink, gallium, gallium to germanium 76. And the germanium 76 would love to decay to arsenic 76. However, the little beta decay is forbidden by energy conservation. The ground state of arsenic 76 is higher and the germanium one. However, the second next neighbor, selenium 76, is lower. So this kind of transition is possible, or this kind, if you want to make it a tunneling or a virtual transition here, it's up to you. But this kind of scenario, this triangle shape here, you need to see double beta decay. So you see the beta decay is blocked by energy conservation, but double beta decay is possible. So you all you know, you all know the table of isotopes, the nice big books, and you go through all the isotopes you can find. If you come up, there's only 35 candidates which have this privileged position here. So older people like me and Mike and Oswaldo, they remember proton decay times. Well, that's easy. You can just buy 50,000 tons of water. It's cheap. And you look for proton decay. Here you have to rely on this certain kind of guys. There is no proton decay, no double beta decay in water out of this. So this makes the expense experiment a little bit more expensive. Furthermore, uh, this is a black box process. Uh, if you uh, go in the particle physics region, any uh, electron number violating process which converts two p quarks into u quarks into electrons can uh, participate in double beta decay. So you see, theoretical particle physicists are quite clever people. There are a lot of things which you can imagine which could exist, and uh, they could all contribute. There's actually a nice interplay with LHC at the moment because LHC starts to restrict and constrain the existence of these objects. So the general scenario is you measure the half-life of the process, it's decaying. You have some phase space describing the final stage, you need a nuclear matrix element for describing the transition from the initial nucleus to the final one. And then you have a quantity of interest, the physics, which in my case I will focus on the light Majorana neutrino exchange. But as I said, there could be others. So if you then re if you if you believe in the in the light Majorana neutrino exchange, the black box will look like this. You have the neutron here going into a proton. The left and the W will use the same the two Ws. You have the the couplings to electrons at the final state, and in the middle you have the, the neutrino mass term. So the quantity epsilon becomes what we call the effective Majorana neutrino mass, and this is given by the total value of uh, the summation over these terms here, which I explain to you on the next slide, the mixing matrix element squared linked to the electron and the neutrino mass eigenstates. And then this kind of equation uh, is a brief from the previous slide we 
the epsilon will be just this term multiplied by the electron mass here. So there's a square dependence between half and the neutrino mass. However, just to remind you, <coughs> already 30 years ago, people have proven that if neutrinos double beta decay is observed, and any and some order of perturbation theory, you can always draw a final diagram which corresponds to a neutrino mass. So the statement is true that if you observe neutrinos double beta decay, then neutrinos are not a runoff to be this. However, if you can't exclude all the beyond standard model physics on the previous slide, then the real work will start because you have to figure out how many percent is my Rana mass contributing to the decay rate when you have Susi and uh, double charge Higgs and others. This is a self this is a text question, but first let's observe it. So about this statement will hold uh, independently. independently. Well, uh, I think it's not a big secret anymore that the neutrinos mass and flavor eigenstates are not identical, and we have the same phenomenon which is known in the quark sector for decades, maybe the mixing. So we have a mixing matrix, like the CKM matrix in the quark sector, and it's written down here. So any it's a three by three mixing matrix, and you see this can be characterized uh, by three angles, theta one, two, theta one, three, and theta two, three. And the complex case, which is in the quark sector, is responsible for CP violation. And it's the aim of high energy neutrino physics people, maybe one day to discover CP violation in the lepton sector. However, if you think on, this, on the electric theory, typically in the phases, you have a lot of complex, com general complex phases, E to the I, whatever. And you can rotate or redefine the fields uh, to get rid of them. However, the neutrino being its own anti particle means you require that a charge conjugated field is identical to the rate to the normal field, which is somehow prohibiting the rotation of complex phases. So the net end result is if you believe neutrinos are Majorana objects, you've got two more CP phases. And unfortunately, they are hard to tackle because they don't show up in oscillation, they only show up in double beta decay, and we have no clue what the values are. So we have this matrix, which is very standard, and there's two additional phases coming from, from the uh, from the uh, Majorana character. Then this, if you write down this term, which I showed you on the previous slide, you see the oscillation parameters coming. Theta 1, 2, this, sorry, C means cosine, S means sine, cosine theta 1, 2 squared, cosine theta 1, 3 squared, sine squared, theta 1, 2, and so on. And you see here are the two complex phases, and you have the absolute value of that. So if the complex phases are minus 1, you have destructive interference in the worst case scenario. And this is completely different from single beta decay. First of all, single beta decay don't have these complex phases. And single beta decay is completely ignorant whether neutrinos are Dirac particles or Majorana particles. So in the past, we were always asked, what do you want to do? Are there competition between beta and double beta? Nowadays, it turns out actually you need both of them because these are complementary measurements. So this is a shortcut here of our current knowledge because you see here the oscillation results come in, so I have to at least tell you what we know. We know theta 1, theta 1, 2, 3 is roughly about 45 degrees is not appearing here. You know, theta 1, 3 is about 9 degrees, which is a major discovery in neutrino physics in the last few years. And you know, theta 1, 2 is about 34 degrees. So this is the, this is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the angles which go in here. And furthermore, the oscillation phenomenon, which is a different form, which uh, depends on the mass square difference of two objects, like m2 square minus m1 square, or m and three square minus and two square. This is shown here. So we know that the, what we call the normal hierarchy, that the solar to describe the solar neutrino problem and the reactor data, we need a splitting between m1 square and m2 square on the order of seven times 10 to the minus i eV square, or so the difference of both numbers. And from atmospheric neutrinos and long baseline experiments, we know that the atmospheric, this can be explained as two times 10 to the minus three However, we don't know the ordering, it could be the other way around, that the big splitting is on the bottom and the small splitting is on the top, or like here. So this one we call normal hierarchy, and this one we call the inverted hierarchy. And oscillations are not absolute mass measurements, that's why we don't know the offset, 
the zero here, so these are the question marks. Is this one or this? And this one or this one? Uh, this one has keep the, keep the colors in mind because this has a profound effect on what we are supposed to see in the beta decay. So this is the same plot again. And what you see here is the expectation for double beta decay, depending on the, as a function of the lines of the three mass, they mean this one is M3 here, this one is M1 here. And then, so let's talk about the inverted one first. So this is a screen band here. That's what the inverted hierarchy to the current oscillation data would predict. Uh, you see, we are talking here in the region of 50 milli electron volts down to 10 milli electron volts. And I give you here a kind of an idea what half-life roughly, what half-life region this uh, will correspond to. So the queen band, if you really tackle this region here, uh, you have to measure half-life well beyond 10 to the 26 here. Well, there is one observation uh, from a Heidelberg group, which claim they have actually found down the meter decay, and I think we have all heard about the last 10 years a lot of noise about that. So this, uh, this would be right, actually 10 to the 25 years would be the right number. This would be up here or in this band over there. Already in tension with cosmology. And furthermore, furthermore, this would imply that all the materials are almost degenerate. So they have probably the same mass and the tiny, tiny variations like fine structure and hyperfine structure. Because you need a small splitting for the oscillations. And if the as the normal hierarchy is actually realized in nature, you have this red, this red band here. And then you see in the normal in the normal hierarchy you can have this effect of absolute cancellation, even so neutrino masses are non-zero. And then you have to go to beyond 10 to the 28 here. Mm -hmm. so this is a kind of a blue bullet point that will follow, spending most of the time on point one. If we claim here correct, this is basically the job of further phase one and exo and common sense. Can we go actually the green band? And if we haven't seen anything by down here. What about the red one? Can we do that? I'm just depending on time, uh, I will continue that. Well, here's a, yeah, here's a shown up version. Uh, this is basically uh, the, the academic plot from a paper from the Heidelberg group showing you these bands, the actual, the actual position of the, of the edges of the band depend on oscillation parameters as is described here. So you see here sine theta 1, 3, cosine theta 1, 3, up and theta 1, 2, cosine theta 1, 2, and all. this is a cartoon from 2006, and there was nothing known about theta 1, 3, and the other one was even more a cartoon. And this is actually the, the, real, the real boundaries if you take the oscillation result, including their errors. And you see the band, this is inverted band, this has this will flatten off here because the solar mixing angle is not, uh, it's not maximum. This is causing the region. That's why the green band is uh, stopping here. But you see the red band and the current, current errors of theta 1, 2 and theta 1, 3. There's a, a severe range where there could be perfect cancellation and double beta decay, even uh, without not, not this non managing neutrinos. As I mentioned before, beta decay measures something else. So this is this combination, so there's no complex phase, and beta decay simply ignores. Uh, the character of the neutrino. This is a new experiment popping up for the Catherine, which is supposed to start in 2015, which is trying to make the beta decay tritium endpoint measurement down to 0.2. The current limit is 2 eV. And all the cosmology is moving on the latest <coughs> data from the cosmic microwave background, and including baryon acoustic oscillations. People claim that the total sum of all neutrino masses is less, 3, less than 0.23 eV. Like in cosmology, I spoke with the project the PI of Kaplan. There is still a little bit of room to go further. And you see that the CMP alone only makes a limit of about 0.8. So it's a bionic population which hammers the mass down. Okay, so this was the introduction. So the search for the double meter decay, uh, the choke is gone here because it's like a search for a needle in the haystack. So I had a picture with the needle in the haystack, and the needle was too large and the haystack too small. So this is basically the haystack you have to find uh, uh, needle. That's the, the, way, the thing you want to look for where it decays. Just to give you an idea, that hopefully everybody can understand. If you go for the screen band, just as a back of the envelope calculation, what I'm talking about, 50 million electron volt, if you wanted something else, just add zeros to everything. 
oder so. Mag ich so radioactive decay law, as you know it from your lecture, but in the, under the assumption that the half life is much longer than the measuring time. I think with 10 to 25 years, it's a pretty fair statement. Uh, well, if you want to measure the sleep immediately at one point, you have to measure 10 to the 26 to 10 to the 27 years. Okay, so for personal amusement, I mean, we, are, we, are, we don't ask for much, but one decay per year. I mean, otherwise it's really no fun. One decay per year. You need something, if you look at the equation, you need something like 10 to the 26 to 10 to the 27 source atoms. Now think about it. One mole of molybdenum 100, which is actually a double beta emitter, one mole of molybdenum 100 is 100 grams. So if you want to have uh, and one mole is 6 times 10 to the 23, so if you want to have 6 times 10 to the 26, there will be 1,000 moles, which means 100 kilogram. So even from the radioactive decay law, if you want to measure this region, you need 100 kilograms of the ice. There's no way out, otherwise you don't, uh, maybe you have one in the century, but then I don't need the experiment anymore. Uh, but this is a game to play, you know, that you only lose, you never have 100% abundance, you have maybe not 100% efficiency, and of course you have this Turbing events and background. So, but nevertheless, it is driven, these numbers are driven by the radioactive decay law. So, like in the first slide, what you have to do, you have to do these experiments on the ground. That's a, there's no way to find out the solar neutrinos and all sorts of neutrinos business. So, what do you actually observe? Well, if you measure the sum energy of the two electrons, it's actually pretty nice. You measure a peak at the Q value of the nuclear transition. So if you know the initial final mass of the nuclei in both fields, you can determine the position of the of the of the uh, of the neutrino that's peak. So that's shown here. So this is germanium 76 case. The peak is supposed to be at 2048. However, in the two neutrino mode, like in beta decay in a similar way because the neutrinos escape, you got a continuous spectrum which is shown here. In yellow, the other one are more exotic. This equation you have seen. So, from the experimental point of view, in a perfect world, the half life sensitivity you can measure depends on the isotopic abundance, the detection efficiency, the mass, and the measuring time linearly. So, isotopic abundance in the background limited case, if this is shown here, for example, here is a peak, and you see that spectrum. If you have a detector, you have all these events all over the place. So, we have a non zero value here. And then the half-life sensitivity scales only with the square root of measuring time. And the other quantity coming in is the background level. This, of course, should be as small as possible. Furthermore, what matters, if you get this peak, the energy resolution is a bit off. The peak should be as good as possible because it goes in here as well. So <clears throat> because if you have only two or three events, you don't want to have them scattered over hundreds of KV, you will never find them. Because there's a two neutrino spectrum, so the half-lives are typically six orders of magnitude shorter. So the only events on here will move in here. So this is a kind of equation, but you see that the A stays in front, which means most of the current and future experiments are almost all are isotopically enriched. That's the only way to increase the sensitivity. Well, this is something, the mass equation again, this is what you measure, that's what you want to know. We have a conversion factor, and this is the dark side of double beta decay, not the dark energy. Uh, it's a dark matter, but it's a dark side. So we were hoping that the phase spaces were actually determined pretty well enough, but now Frank, we are and others came up, and we have recalculated phase spaces, so they have changed. Nuclear physics is a complex beast. Osvaldo is the expert, you should ask him about everything which is linked to the nuclear metrics element. Just to give you a feeling uh, what's going on, for example, in the two neutrino decay mode, this is germanium 76, which I've mentioned before, going to selenium 76, it's a zero plus zero plus transition. For the normal mode, it's just two gamma tellers. So basically, what you have to do is that you measure the PGT or the gamma teller strength from here to here, from here to here, you multiply those numbers, and then you sum up all the one plus transitions up to the to Q value, basically. Yeah. Have you made a Okay, for Swallow, you have to do the job in the coffee break. Um, <laughs> and now it's done. It's not too good. Uh, ah, this is here. So, <laughs> so, so the experimental part. <laughs> <laughs> so 
this is not a fantastic form because you have started data leaving. So this is Gerda, must be because it's a German female first name. It's the only female in this campus. It's burning already. This is, you come down send it's a massive object that actually must be used to um, Just to go through everything, the Kamlan, Kamlan Sen, uh, Kamlan Sen uh, is a simulator, a thousand pounds of it. It's a simulator of people and David Balloon. Because of time, of time, I have to rush a bit, so I don't ask me for details later. But they have installed 400 kilograms of enriched xenon 936, which is another double giga isotope. They haven't found anything published here. And uh, this is already putting tension on the claim of Club Earth, which somehow has vanished as well, unfortunately, due to this break on this mission. Uh, but they have a big hump here. This is probably coming from Fukushima, that's what they claim. Uh, it's not a little here, but it's a position where you have to look at. Let's see, EXO, EXO result. Uh, they don't see anything. This is a region of interest here between the red, the red bands, and so this their number comes up again with like a half like of this. And EXO basically exclude that this pump in Kamlan Sen is usually double beta decay. However, EXO is riding the wave in a way that they expect four events in the signal region. They only see one, so they can make a very strong limit of any additional contribution like double beta decay. However, if this stays one that they expect ten, then they have to question their background for this. Anyhow, whatever you do in this conversion from xenon to the germanium half-life, there is always the uncertainties in the matrix element. So the idea was to build Gerda using the old Heidelberg Moscow and Hijax electron detectors, all germanium detectors which were used in the 90s, making and getting rid of all the material and putting the detectors in a kind of a liquid argon detector for cooling and shielding, having water around. And you can tell the details here. This is located in the Francisco underground lab. You see the detectors are on a fishing string. They are all isotopically enriched. You put them in here, and you have several of these strings in the detectors. So, cut a long story short, this is the spectrum and in the region of interest. We made for the first time in double beta decay because of the good energy resolution we put. A blind analysis, we did, nobody looked in the data region and the peak region to make sure that we are not biased. There's a background, you see it's pretty flat, it was estimated from here to here. From the other lines, you can determine whether there is something in here. So we made a prediction and the background model and everything before we ever looked in here. We made really a statement, okay, if this, that there's no big then we should see so many events in this region. And after opening the box, as you see here, the blown up version and the normal version, there isn't really a peak. And this combined with the Xenon data basically puts a strong tension or strongly disfavors the claim of, of, uh, of the Heidelberg from 2001. Most experiments, but these are preparing for phase two. EXO has at least two times more data on paper and hopefully release them soon. So, what the future? Because of this magnificent seven, uh, because of the, they should be all online in 2014 using different isotopes. Which also have vanished somehow from my slides. And, uh, but, uh, and there's a lot of RD projects going on. And the beauty of this field, I have to say, people are aware of the complexity of the problem. And if you're really forced to go to the red region, it can be that experimental approaches which we prefer now will not ever work anymore and we have to do something else. So we have a healthy region, we have the flagship experiment, and still a lot of RD experiments where people are looking at. As well as all this is going on in a good mood, I skip my own one, which is Cobra. Some funny four foot of hidden beta decays for those of you who are interested in. We always start again. Oh, that is something then. Okay, so as that's what I mentioned before, with this uh, for measuring for measuring the the entangling the 50 milli electron volt band. You, these are the typical combining matrix elements from different groups, including Oswaldo's group. You see there's a certain scattering due to the unhealthy water half-lives you have to measure to touch the top part of the green band. And as from the other academic code I showed you before, even the lower edge here on the green band, which is shown here, depends on the value of beta 1, 2. And you see here, from here to here, from the current uncertainty to beta 1, 2, there is a factor of 2. If you think about the sensitivity on neutrino mass goes with the square root, you have to improve experimental parameters by a factor of 16. 
and we are already at the edge what you can do. So pretty much I would encourage you to measure either one is better. That's the message here. Just to give you a feeling for the for the other one, for the red one, there is no real proposal. This will be cold scale experiments, it will be very, very expensive. You need more precise data to really get the boundaries here. And things which you don't care about at the moment, uh, uh, basically will will matter more example like this pill, we have to worry about solar neutrinos. You know, yesterday's discovery is to the signals tomorrow's spectrum. Uh, solar neutrino electron scattering will be a major deal when we work that out, major deal for our beta decay, and maybe all these hackers which are not able to decide to discriminate between one and two electrons will fail at that level because boron A solar neutrinos covers all all isotopes of interest, right? So on the level of 10 to the minus 7 comes with the AB kiloton in here. This was something I'd skip. There are some ideas about resonance double electron capture from an isotope to a decided state, but uh, nature is providing us this kind of scenario which was proposed by Dana Bayou and the Google some 20, 30 years ago. We went through a strong campaign with the uh, penny traps. So this is an alternative mode if you're on the right side of the para mass parabola. So you have something like double positron decay, double electron decay of the mixed mode. And indeed we found a candidate uh, which in principle has a 10 to 7 time enhancement in this resonance transition from its state to the excited state of the daughter, but it's got a medium 152. But unfortunately the battery is just doing another body case, so it's not really too promising. So let me let me summarize. I tried to explain the double field decay of central importance on neutrino physics. It's gold related to both the fundamental character of neutrinos. I can't get rid of George W. I'm sorry about that. Uh, interesting kinds at the moment because of LHC and double beta decay, TV scale uh, exploration of the different mechanisms. We have new experiments starting. I showed you uh, except xenon results and Jordan. There is more building up. However, to go to 50 milli electron volts requires hundreds of kilograms of initial periods, and this will be really expensive. And uh, I encourage the nuclear structure people from this LF isotope pairs to basically should, should uh, get all the nuclear structure information you need. So, either one day I'm bobbing up here like at Hillary on Mount Everest, claiming we have found out the beta decay while the fact is too old, uh, thinking that we maybe don't find. <laughs> I want to say something a little bit about the rate, possible rate of improvement of the cosmological stuff and some of the medicines. How much better do you think I can get over the next decade? Um, as, as you, you showed Lev Landau's plot, right? Or cosmology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the point is, I mean, I mean, what cosmology typically measures omega nu h squared. You already have intrinsically the uncertainty of the Hubble constant squared, right? So the point is that the Hubble constant determined from CMB from Planck is in a slight tension with the Hubble HST measurement of the Hubble constant. So there is some uncertainties. Furthermore, I, I, I had to ask C. Hannes when we made the new plot. There was already the plot which parameters and cosmologies are correlated to the neutrino masses. And there are some, some parameters like sigma 8, mm -hmm. the kind of the, the, the light to meta, meta threshold yeah. kind of things in galaxy H, Hubble constant, and a few more. And uh, people, they, they are now very reasonably precisely known, but nevertheless, uh, uh, people are maybe pushing it slightly too hard. There's always a tiny dependence there. And the correlation and systematic studies are the crucial, as, as you as talked about systematics yesterday, I mean, this is a crucial part here. And you have seen the sum of the masses from CMB alone is about 1 EV. Mm -hmm. Only the bionic acoustic oscillation hammer is the best fit when you're down mm -hmm. to zero. Mm -hmm. So there is some, some room, but cosmology is of course making sure these stringent threshold, uh, stringent limits and boundaries on it. How, how, how good they can be at the end of the day, they claim a lot, they claim they can do much better in the future, but Again, this model dependencies and correlation must be taken seriously to account. And I don't have seen this correlation plot of all the parameters with the neutrino masses for the news data. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's, let's see.